Okay, so yesterday we began our look at digital color and how we represent color using numbers. And representing a degree of lightness and darkness using a number is, is kind of easy. You have lightness in one and darkness in the other, and you have a range of shades of gray in between. But color is more complex. So green is different from blue, but you know, green is more of what, or more of what, you know, or different in what way. And so um, we talked about the hue, saturation, and brightness model. So the hue is um, where some color is on the range from, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo through violet. So it's positioned, say, on, on kind of the rainbow scale would be its hue. Saturation was the a measure of the purity of the color. So on the left here, there's a highly saturated color here. The saturation is turned all the way down, so we get gray. And then brightness was kind of familiar territory because um, imagine it's like a dimmer switch. So when the brightness is turned all the way down, it's black. And as you increase the brightness, you, you get you know the color. Okay, so it's the hue, saturation, and brightness model. And we saw that you can go into Photoshop or PowerPoint or one of these things, you know, draw something, pick a color, and you get the operating system's color picker. It'll vary from operating system to operating system. This is a Mac one here. But you can get a feel for how the hue, saturation, and brightness works. So in this one, the hue is um, measured, you know, as the position here uh, as you go around. The saturation is how far you are from the center, and the brightness is a separate slider here. We saw in Windows, um, it didn't really use a circle. It was just a square with hue and saturation in one part and then brightness on another. Okay? You can use sliders as well to see the difference. Now, the value of hue, saturation, and brightness is that it most um, clearly maps the way humans think about color and talk about color and imagine color. So it's easy to you know to decide on the hue of something. Something is bluish, greenish, reddish, you know. Saturation, something is pure, strong color or not, and brightness we're very familiar with. So that's the main value of it. But we don't typically use it that often in computer systems. In computer systems, we typically opt for the red, green, blue model of color, or the RGB system. And this um, arrangement here might look familiar to you if you did physics, for example, for the leaving cert. Um, you would have seen this where we have red, green, blue, um, yellow, magenta, turquoise, and then white in the middle. So in the RGB system, you have a source of red light, a source of green light, and a source of blue light. And where the red and the green and the blue all overlap, you have white. Where the red and the green overlap, you have yellow. And when you have blue and green together, you get cyan. And when you have red and blue together, you get this magenta. So I could actually get three torches a red one, a green one, and a blue one, black out all the windows, and you know, I could shine them on the whiteboard, and once I finally, if I had three hands, I'd have to get some volunteers, if I finally overlapped them all, you would actually see white. So, um, if everything was the, you know, if it was the exact, if it was the proper red, the proper green, and the proper blue. So your physics teacher might have done that with you. You can also, as an experiment, where you have a color wheel, and there's the different colors, and you spin it around really, really fast. And once it gets fast enough, your eyes can't see the differences anymore, and the colors merge into white. Okay. So in the RGB system, we have three variables then. We have a red value, a green value, and a blue value. And each of these then ranges from 0 to 255. Why do you think that is? Well, 0 to 255 is 256 possible different values, so that's one byte. So it's, it's handy. 
Um, obviously, 0 to 127 would have been handier too, but I guess people figured that didn't give you enough enough control, enough, enough variety, enough precision in your colors. So we have one value representing the redness, one value representing the greenness, and one value representing the blueness of the color. So if we look here, this red, this color here has the red turned up fully. So the red is 255, green is zero, blue is zero. And you get this pure, full-on, highly saturated red as a result. Here, the red is zero, the green is zero, and the blue is 200. So the blue is almost, well, it's not, I suppose not, it's nearly full-on pure blue. But when you take it down a notch, it starts to get darker. So with the RGB system, the lower the values, the closer you are to black, and the higher the values, the closer you, you like more, higher values means more color, more light, lower values means less. So here, blue is the only color in play, and it's not quite full on blue, but it's still fairly strong, fairly bright, fairly saturated blue. Here, the red and the green are maxed out, and the blue is set to zero. So when you have red and green mixed together, you get yellow. You'll notice that um, it's not the same as mixing paints like you did in primary school. If you mix red paint with green paint, you get, I would, you get some mucky brown color, I'd say. But mixing red light and green light, like more is brighter. It turns out with paints, more is darker. Here, the red is zero, the green is 178, and the blue is zero. 178 is about the halfway point between. That's not, well, it's not quite halfway, but it's it's you know close to the middle there between zero and 255, I think. So. It's certainly a green. Green is the only color in play here, uh, but it's a it's a it's not full on bright green. Here, when we reduce the value even lower, we start to see it's getting darker. So the lower the green value, the darker the color. Now, when the red and the green and the blue values are the same, we get a shade of gray. Here, the values are quite high, so it's a light gray. As the values get lower, the shade of gray gets darker. But there's no, there's no one color dominating. When they're equal, it's a, it's a shade of gray. Here, lower again and darker again until we get very dark. And then if we max them all out, full on red, full on green, full on blue is white. So it's not, it's not terribly intuitive that more color would give you white. You know, if you think about paper and pens, you know, it's, 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 it's not intuitive. But when the red light and the green light and the blue light are full on shining in the same spot, that's where you get your white from. And obviously, red zero, green zero, blue zero, pure black. So you imagine them as lights, and if all the lights are turned off, then it's, it's completely dark. In HTML, you may have seen RGB used to specify colors. So here, for example, the red value is 128, the green value is 128, and the blue value is 255. In hexadecimal, that's 8080FF. So you might have seen when you're doing um, your HTML module, you might have seen colored specified in this way. So that's what's going on there. And similarly here, decimal zero is hex zero zero, decimal 255 is hex FF, Decimal 128 is hex 80. In CSS, in fact, you can actually 
specify it using hash and then hex, or you can say RGB open bracket and give the decimal RGB values if you want. But you can only do that in the, well, you should only be specifying colors in, in the CSS anyway, in fairness. Okay. Now, in a digital image then, if the image is stored using RGB, you have three separate channels, we call them. And you can, in Photoshop, actually open up and Photoshop in a way that you can see each channel individually. And so for each pixel, you store the redness, the greenness, and the blueness of each one. And here we can see that um, in the red channel, for example, the difference between the red stripes and, you know, red and orange stripes and white stripes is very minimal. That's because when the red is full on and the white is full on, they're pretty much the same, the same values. Okay. So you can see the difference between red objects and white objects is, is hard to see. Okay. So here's like the RGB, all of them combined together. Here's the red channel on its own, the green channel on its own, and the blue channel on its own. So when you view these in Photoshop, you just see them in a, a monochrome representation. So on the red channel, um, if it's a high red value, then it'll appear as white, and if it's a low red value, it'll appear dark or it's black. You can see there that um, in the red channel, you can't see the stripes very very well. However, in the green channel, there's a big difference between um, red stripes and white stripes because their green values are very different. And similarly in the blue channel. Okay. You can imagine my delight when I found doors um, lined up in red, green, and blue, one after the other. I couldn't have faked um, uh, a better image if I tried. Okay, so you know where these are? Down behind um, Paul Street Shopping Centre. Little small narrow streets there. So you can see here, for example, that in the red channel, the red door is quite light. It's because its red values are high. Um, in the green channel, you can't really tell that this door was red or this door was blue. There's nothing much to go on. But knowing it's the green channel, you could say that this door is the more green of the of the two of the three of them. And you can see here in the blue channel then the blue door is the is the lightest. Okay. And we've seen this already, HTML color codes. Now, having a look at this here, so here we have the so yeah, sorry, just to make it clear. The first two digits are the red, the next two digits are the green, and the next two digits are the blue. It's RGB. No. So here, for example, the red is maxed out, and the green is maxed out, and the blue is zero. So when we get red and green mixed together, we get pure yellow. Having a look at this here, what do you think this might be? FF2020. So what's the what's the dominant color here? Yeah. Red. So red is full on maximum value, and then the other two are they? First of all, they're equal. That's significant. Are they high values or low values? Low. I mean, are they very low? Pretty much. Pretty much. So I think this color won't be far off pure full on red. It might have some of the, you know, kick taken out of it, but it'll be it'll be pretty red. Oh yeah, that's fairly red. I think there's no there's no question there. Next up, what do you think this color might be? So there's the red part, the green part, and the blue part. Does any one dominate? Green. No. The last bit's blue. blue. The last bit's blue. So certainly, blue is winning here in the competition between red, green, and blue. You know. Blue is winning because the other two aren't even at the races. They're zero. So this is certainly a blue. Now, is it a bright, full-on blue? 
Is it a dark, hardly there blue, or is it somewhere in the middle? Yeah. I think it's somewhere in the middle. Okay, eight zero is pretty much halfway. So um, I would I'd say it would still look dark enough. Ah, it's pretty dark, you know. Um, so that's halfway. But certainly, there's no doubt here that it was going to be blue. Okay. Next up here now, this is a tricky one. So, red, green, and blue. The blue is certainly edged ahead. The blue is maxed out at FF, which is 255. So there's more blue in this than there are the other things. Now, the other two things then are significant. What's significant about them is that they're the same values. So we're not... Um, it's not a situation where you have like red and green, say, mixing together to give some other third color. Um, what's happening here is that this is a kind of blue. But then it's tending towards or away from white. No. D0, D0 is a high value or low value? High, it's quite high. So I would say that this is blue, certainly, mm -hmm. and it's a shade of blue that's heading in the direction of white. Like if it was FF, 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 it would be pure white. Now it's not pure white, um, but I would say it's not far off it. So it's a shade of blue that has white tendencies. Okay, it's a bit more purpley than I was expecting, but there you go. What about this one here? Eight zero, eight zero, eight zero. So what's significant about those values? They're all the same. So we know it's a shade of gray. No, is it at the white end of the scale, the black end of the scale, or somewhere in the middle? It's pretty much bang in the middle. So it's a middling shade of gray. Next up, what about, oops, I gave that one away, didn't I? Yep, okay. You can see there that it's a much higher set of values. Again, they're all the same, so it's a shade of gray, but they're very high values, so it's, it's very close to white. What about this? This is the same value as before, except the red has edged ahead a notch. The red has made a bolt for the finish line, whereas the green and the blue are still just quite high. What do you think might be? Pink. Yeah, so if you took this color and then threw a tiny bit of red in there, you'd get pink. Okay, so you get the idea. So the interaction between the red, the green, and the blue, you have to think about. With hue, saturation, and brightness, you know, you could look at a color, you could look at that door and say, okay, it's in the blue range okay and that's its hue saturation high or low it's fairly fairly pure blue i think i mean it seems you know well yeah yeah we could certainly discuss the saturation and then the brightness it's quite bright i think mm -hmm. whereas looking at this red green blue values not so easy okay certainly the blue is high i would say then that maybe the other two values then would be in the middle somewhere, the, the red and the green. Okay. I'm going to do some more and push the boat out. So in this one here, the blue value is certainly edged ahead, but the red and the green are equal, so it's, it's not changing it away from its blueness. It's just altering the lightness of it, but not, not very much. Here, have a, have a go at the next one here. Do you want to go by yourself there? So the red is winning, and then the other two are fairly up there. So I would say pink, yeah, I would say it's more the same. Okay, what do you think the next one might be? Well, we've red, green, and blue. Certainly, what's winning? Green. Green. Is it winning by much? winning by a lot. Yeah. The blue isn't at the races even. Yeah. 
And the red is the red. What kind of value is the red? Most it's hardly worth talking about the red value even. You know, so we're pretty much looking at pure full-on green. Well, yeah, it doesn't come more full-on than that really, you know, I think. Okay. Next up, what do you think this one might be? It's mostly green, certainly. It's nearly full-on green. The other two values are very high. So I would say it's a green with, you know, white tendencies. So we're looking at a pale green. I'm wondering, is the difference between the red and the blue significant? My guess is no. I don't think it's, it's that significant. So I think we're talking about a pale green. Ah, yeah. Okay. Next up, too easy. Yeah. Next up, almost as easy. Gray. Yeah. Blackish, whitish, middleish. Uh, middleish. Middleish. Next up, what do you think? Uh, red. The red is certainly at set to the maximum possible value. The blue isn't really worth worrying about, I think. The green, though, is 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 a contender. You know, the green is doing something here. So what happens if it, if it was full, if it was maximum red, maximum green, what would you get? Yellow. yellow. No, it's not quite going to be yellow, is it? It's going to be yellow where the red has dominated and the green has been, you know, put in second place. So what does that sound like? I would say it sounds like orange, but I wouldn't want to stake my reputation on it. I would, actually. Um, okay. Take that back. Um, next up, what do you think this might be? It's a tough one. It's a tough one, isn't it? So the red is halfway. The green is significant, but not halfway. And the blue is quite high. So it's more blue than anything else, but the red is the red is 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 in there. What do you get when you get red and blue together when they're both full? That was the magenta, wasn't it? It was purple, the magenta. Now in this case, so it's magenta-ish. Maybe the blue has edged ahead, and certainly the green value isn't insignificant so it's giving it it's making it light so i'm thinking a light-ish purpley bluish i would say light purple all right that was i think this is darker than i was expecting next up whose turn is it it's too easy or is it so when the red and green let's say it was FFFF00, what would that be? Red and green, maximum, full on. Red and green together give yellow. yellow. Now, in this case, it's yellow, but there's a lot of blue as well. So it's yellow that's being pushed in the direction of white. Yeah? Like if it was FFFFFF, it would be white. If it was FFFF00, it would be pure yellow. So I think it's yellow heading in the direction of white. So I would say pale yellow. Pale yellow we have. Um, next one, I'm not at all sure what this would be. So the red, the green, and the blue. The green and the blue are fairly equal. If the green and the blue were maxed out, what would we have? Cyan, wouldn't we? So it looks like a dark cyan. I think the red doesn't really contribute much. So if we had cyan, but it was darker, what would that be? I suppose a kind of blue. I'm not sure what kind of blue. Let's have a look. All right, I wasn't expecting that. I know to think about it, that's what dark cyan would look like, I guess. What would we call that? A teal? I don't know. Next up there, um, the red is very high. The green quite high, the blue is there. So, what do we think? Yeah. 
We want to hazard a guess. Yeah, I'm thinking some kind of orange. I'm just not sure if it's light or dark. Or... But I'm definitely thinking orange. Oh, okay. So, brown. brown. I, I think orange is a bit of a stretch. Next up, easy really, I think. The 0303 for the green and blue values is just a red herring. They don't they don't contribute anything. So what do you think the red so it's just red? Is it like towards the top? Towards the black end or somewhere in the middle? I think it's kind of in the middle. So I'm thinking a nice strong darkish red, I would say. I think I couldn't have said it better. Um, Next up, um, red value is in the middle, below middle, green value fairly high, blue value in the middle. So what are we thinking? Do you know situations where two of them are high? So like red and green gives you yellow. We're not in that situation here, I don't think. You know, we're just in a situation where the green is dominating, and then the others then are lightening it up. So I would, I don't know, I would say I'm thinking a paleish green, but we'll have a look and see. Uh, 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 not sure what we call that. It's certainly not a strong green. Last one, zero, 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 too easy. Okay. No. So, how are we doing for time? We're doing great for time. Okay. So, so yesterday we saw hue saturation brightness. That was red, green, and blue. There's a whole other system now, which is the LAB system. And the L is typically an uppercase, and the A and B is in lowercase. Sometimes it's L, A star, B star. But it's you'll see what we're talking about in a second. Only. So in this system, we have luminance and chrominance. So luminance is the lightness and darkness of something. So if something is bright, it has a high luminance value. If it's dark, it has a low luminance value. This system is significant because humans actually experience lightness and darkness and color separately. There are separate cells in our eyes for um, the, the rods and the cones. So the rods are sensitive to the lightness and darkness of things, and then the cones are sensitive to the color. Which is why, if you get up to go to the toilet in the middle of the night, you can see things, but you probably can't make out their color if you think about it really hard. If you think about it really hard, you'll see the color because you know what color it is, but that's your brain remembering. When light levels are very low, we can't properly sense color. Also, we're much more sensitive to the luminance, to the lightness and darkness, than we are to the color. Humans actually suck at color, but we're great at lightness and darkness. So subtle change in the lightness and darkness we'll pick up, subtle changes in the color, not so much. Okay? And so, you resort to the LAB system, or you resort to treating the luminance and the chrominance separately when you want to exploit those properties of human vision. One of the places we see LAB, or its cousins, is in analog television. But first, let me, let me make that, that point some more. So in the RGB system here, you can see um, the information is spread across 
the red and the green and the blue channels fairly uniformly. In the LAB system, you can see that most of the information in this image is in the lightness. In terms of color, like there's not a whole lot going on here. And so you can see that the lightness part of the image or the lightness component or the lightness channel is much more information, much more of the, the valuable, useful, detailed information. And then the A and the B don't, um, don't have a whole lot to offer. Just to, sorry, to recap on the A and the B, you have this scale here where you have two values, A and B, they can be negative and positive, each of them. And so, um, like, so over here, A is high and B is high. Here, A is high and B is low. Here, both A and B are very low. And here, A is very low and B is high. So that's the scale there. So all of the colors, you know, you can kind of pick out your color here that you want. So, you know, yellow is kind of in here, just about. You know, but pretty much all the colors are here. It's a different way of, of breaking it up. Now, so there's a really cool trick then we can do as well. well. I'm not sure if we'll show you that now. So here we have the lightness channel, and then here's the A information and the B information. You can see there's a bit more in the B, but the bulk of the valuable information is in the lightness channel. Okay. Now, human vision is less sensitive to chrominance than it is to luminance. So that's what I'm saying when you, you walk around in the middle of the night. So one of the tricks that JPEG uses, for example, is that it subsamples the chrominance part of the image by leaving the luminance part intact. Now, what does subsampling mean? Well, subsampling means you throw away some of the information. So here's a picture of me, right, obviously, with 400 pixels, OK? And it's stored in RGB. So it's 24 bits per pixel, OK? Here, I have separated out the luminance and the chrominance and I've kept the luminance, the lightness and darkness part intact but I've thrown away huge amounts of the colour information. I've thrown away three quarters of all of the colour information and it's not that bad. Can you spot the differences? See there on the space invaders behind? Kind of got a bit of a little blue halo. Can you make that out? Yeah. Just about. So in this image, three quarters of the color information has been chucked away. It's actually not that bad. Like, So in terms of the size of this, it's significantly smaller than the 24-bit image where you have a red, a green, and a blue channel. Um, the luminance is, is intact, but the chrominance has been um, seriously. Did I say three quarters, or is it much more than that? It's much more than three quarters of the of the um, information. It is in fact fifteen sixteenths of the information has been thrown away because it's one hundred by it's gone from four hundred to four hundred to one hundred by one hundred. So this image, um, the color image is one sixteenth. The color part of the information is one sixteenth of what it was before, and you barely notice, and that's because humans suck at color. Okay. Um, so in terms of the size, then there's quite a, a difference. But you know, if I was had to pay forty eight euro to send this image somewhere and 18 euro to send this image this one represents great value really you know if you look really really close you can see that sort of halo there okay um if i did the same trick 
with the luminance and threw away three quarters or even 15 sixteenths of the luminance, you see a huge difference. So here on the right, a lot of the luminance information is missing and it has a significant impact. Whereas when you throw away the, the chrominance information, it's not so bad. Okay. So um, the main situation then we might use this in is where we're going to do that. So if we store an image like this, we can transmit the luminance component intact and we can chuck away some of the chrominance and, and get away with it. So if you're going to do that, you might convert from RGB to LAB or to some variation of that. Another situation where you would have seen this color system is in ye olde analog television. So before digital television, there was analog television. Before analog color television, there was analog black and white television. So if you imagine a situation where we used to have black and white TV and we had TV towers transmitting black and white television, then we get to a situation where we want to transmit color television. You could have ended up in a situation where you were transmitting black and white for all the people with black and white TVs and transmitting a color signal for all the people who'd gone out and bought color TVs and you were transmitting both things twice until some cutoff point where you told the people with black and white TVs to, you know, go spend some money and get a color one. But actually what the engineers did was very, very clever. Using a system like the LAB system, they allowed the black and white signal to carry on as normal. And then they just added to that the information that you would have needed to generate the color signal. So the people with black and white TVs still had the black and white part of the image to look at as normal. And then the people with color TVs had the black and white image and the information to turn that into a color image. And so in situations where you were storing images to be used um, for analog TV, I mean, you don't have that anymore, but in situations where you had that, you would have used something like um, an LAB color system. So for some old console systems, some of the first console systems or some of the first gaming systems, you might have had to convert everything to LAB in order to have it um, work well on, a, on, a, on an analog TV. Okay. We see less and less of it um, except in situations where we're going to start throwing some of the information away. The last color scheme we have is the CMYK system and in many respects then this is the antithesis of the RGB system. So in the CMYK system you have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black ink. Now, with the RGB system, the more light you add to the darkness, the brighter it gets. But when you're dealing with ink, the more ink you add to a white page, the darker it gets. So whereas RGB is additive, CMYK is subtractive. The K, by the way, is for black, just so we don't confuse it with blue. If we said CMYB, you might think it was cyan, magenta, yellow, and blue or something. So K for black. Okay? So the printer captures that in. Exactly. Yeah. This is where you've seen this before. If you look at, say, the Sunday newspaper, you'll see a little test strip where you'll see cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And then possibly cyan and magenta together, cyan and yellow together, you know, you might see these, these colors also in the test strip. 
No, I think in theory, you could probably make do in a perfect world with cyan, magenta, and yellow and make black that way. But if you think about a newspaper or a magazine, most of the time you're just, or a lot of the time you're printing text in plain black. So it does make sense and it's much more cost effective to just throw black ink in there. But I think theoretically you might be able to make do with cyan, magenta, and yellow. But black ink is cheap and easy. Okay? But you've seen this combination of colors in newspapers um, or even cereal boxes. If you, um, if you take the box apart, the bit that was covered over and glued over, if you see there, you'll see again. And so that's so that the printer can, can check. So the printer might come along, take a, you know, every hundredth or every thousandth print and compare the test strip, you know, with a standard strip. Hold them side by side and see that everything is going okay. Or there might even be some automated process, some scanner that would look at those colors and see that they're coming off the printer okay. Similarly, when you go to buy ink, you can um, buy the cyan and magenta and yellow and black separately, typically, or the black and the color come separate. I have one at home, it's very old, um, but it, um, it was a six color one. So the color cartridge had the cyan and magenta and yellow, and then green and blue and red as well. And then the black was separate, and that was supposed to give better color and stuff and blah, blah, blah. Don't think it took off. Those color combinations, that's where you've seen them. And that's what's going on. The printer is looking. The printer wants to see um, that they're coming out okay. So, <coughs> so higher values then will yield darker colors. And this is much easier to visualize if you can think back to primary school mixing your paints. So like blue and yellow gives you green. You know, easy enough. So if you've no cyan, no yellow, no magenta, and no black, basically if you have a white page and you put nothing on it, you get white. If you have a white page and you have 100% black, then you'll get black. And in this example here, if you have 50% cyan, 50% yellow, zero magenta, and zero black, well, that's mixing cyan and yellow will give you green. So for CMYK, we represent the values as a percentage. You can see it's not it's not very digital or not very um, computery and that 0 to 100 doesn't you know doesn't doesn't take up a nice even amount of bytes or anything like that you know but that that's the way we do it. So cyan magenta yellow black. Now um, Obviously, if 100% cyan, you get cyan, 100% magenta, magenta, 100% yellow, 100% black, and so on. Here we have cyan and yellow and a little bit of black. I don't think you notice the black that much, but it's making that a bit darker there. Obviously, if you want a shade of gray then, you don't use any color. Imagine if you're painting or printing, you just use more or less black. Here are the magenta and the yellow. Um, are giving us this quite pure red. If we look here, and we'll let go there, or here maybe, we've got um, mostly yellow, no black, a tiny bit of magenta. And then next up, just a little bit of magenta, a little bit of cyan, we're getting that kind of purple. And I'm surprised here at how much yellow is in this pink. I wouldn't have expected to be there so much yellow in there. Okay. Now, for some people, color is, is their business. I mean, if you work for Pennies or Zara or Marks and Spencers and you're ordering, you know, 10,000 t-shirts from a factory in China or in India, you need to be quite specific about the color that you want if it's going to, you know, match perfectly um, the pants you're getting made somewhere else are like the shoes that are like this, this season's color, whatever. Similarly, if you're a printer and you get an order from CIT 
for um, 100 brochures and they want the CIT logo in a particular colour, I mean, they can't put up and say, well, I want a kind of, you know, darkish red, you know, with a hint of purple, like that, that doesn't cut it. So there are different colour systems used in different industries. If you're talking about a web page and you want a particular colour on the screen, you specify that in red, green and blue, in the RGB system. Now, if your monitor is dodgy, if your monitor is a bit bluish, obviously you're going to experience that colour a different way. So there are companies that provide calibration technologies. So you can get things that can like stick onto your monitor and will make sure the colour coming off it is the same standard colour that everyone else is going to see. For printing, you will specify a colour using CMYK. So if you phone up the printer, so if you take, say, for example, CIT style guidelines, they specify the RGB value for the screen and they specify the CMYK value for printing. I think they're off. I think the the CM the RGB value is a bit pinkish. I think it should be a bit more red. Um, this company here, AGT7, they were in the business of specifying color. And so this is an ad from a graphic design magazine. And of course, the joke here is that anyone in the graphic design business would know that C0, M0, Y0, K100 is black. Um, similarly, um, no, no surprises here, or no prizes for guessing what C0, Magenta 60, Yellow 90, and K0s. It's orange. No. If you're specifying clothing and stuff, so so to solve this problem, for example, there's a company called Pantone, which you've heard of. And you might have sometimes seen, you know, sometimes seen you know, um, a mug with say, you know, Pantone. I might say, you know, C90, whatever. So Pantone is a company that produces swatches, like little kind of color charts, okay? And so it turns out if you do want 10,000 t-shirts in a particular um, shade of orange, you probably don't say, I want it um, with this cyan, magenta, yellow, and black value. You probably don't send the CMYK values. Actually, what you do is you get out your Pantone color swatch, and you'll say to the factory, I want it in... Um, Pantone C172 and then the, the um, people in that factory then will look up you know what combinations of dyes they need to dye the fabric that color and when it comes off the process they'll hold it up against their Pantone swatch and see okay that's okay so Pantone actually has um, got involved in the colour specification business and has been around for donkey's years. You can even buy little things that look like USB sticks. So let's say you're a fashion designer and you're on your holidays in Italy and you know you're in some village in Tuscany and you see someone has painted a wall orange and you've got oh my god that's like the colour of the season you know everyone's going to be wearing that colour next season I'm going to make sure of it. You can actually hold this little USB type thing up to the wall and it'll tell you the RGB value, the CMYK value, and it may even come back with saying that's Pentone C7419, whatever. So you can specify the color. So it's like a little tiny little scanner. So for people in certain industries, color is, is very important and they need to be very precise about it. And so they have different schemes for specifying colors. In the computer industry, we're mostly interested in red, green, and blue. Um, and here, just to wrap up, obviously no, no prizes here for guessing um, what color C5, M90, Y100, and K0 is. That's red. Okay. So we have RGB, LAB, HSB, and CMYK. And then Pantone as well, for good measure. Okay, any questions on any of that?
Cool. Okay. And we'll look at this the next day.